snow today and um, hit the ski trails and so forth. And so the people in the laboratory this afternoon are very anxious to get started on that so they can follow you immediately afterward. <laughs> and of course, there's no class on Monday, but there will be a quiz next Friday. I haven't made up the quiz yet, so I can't give you... And that's wrong, isn't it? Friday. 23rd, right? Or is it the 26th? 26th is in the book, that's right, I was right. Week from Monday, there's quiz. So I thought that uh, in order that those people were going to stay home and study this weekend, that I would um, spend the uh, first, um, as much time as necessary, uh, answering questions on any part of the course that's preceded this. Um, and in view of that, maybe I better say to there may be something next Friday. This will cut down the final, make the final e easier. So I'm ready for questions now on any part of the course. But uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, what importance would you place on the use of natural yeast versus cultured yeast for the quality of the wine? Well, very important. Every place in the world in, say, a wet or rainy year, even in areas where they don't traditionally use pure yeast cultures, say in a wet year in Germany or a wet year in Burgundy, they use thousands of yeast cultures. As a matter of fact, the largest suppliers of pure yeast cultures are not in this country, they're in Europe. Uh, the little uh, experiment station in Geisenheim distributes 25,000 cultures a year. A good part of that going to German wineries, but others going to wineries all over the world. Part of the income of the experiment station is that. Yes, I think you have to have pure yeast cultures in many conditions, and maybe in all conditions it's better. It's really, um, I don't want to get on Dr. Kunke's field, so I'll let you... Uh, follow through on that. We have just not been able to establish here meaningful differences between yeast cultures as far as quality is concerned. Sometimes they get a little more sulfide, sometimes a little less, things like that. But um, in general, a pure yeast culture is all right. But we've been able to, for many years, to show many differences when you had non-yeasted samples. That was the part of the problem in 1936, and it was certainly the problem at the turn of the century. Uh, fermentations would stick with one, two, three, four percent alcohol of uh, sugar content and low alcohol and then they would get invasions of lactobacilli and you'd have milky cloudy wines. If I were going to establish a winery, quality winery in California to answer your question specifically, I would use pure yeast cultures, surely. Next. Yes, sir. Well, as I say, there are much more of them used in Europe than there are more suppliers of them there. There are many farmers that don't use them, small farmers and so forth, but all the larger wineries. As soon as they get enough equipment that it makes a difference, then they begin to use pure yeast cultures. If you got a cellar that's full of uh, yeast already, lots of wood and so forth, if you don't use it, you probably get enough yeast already. But like Chateau Latour, for example, when they put in the new stainless steel tanks and so forth, they had to go into some sort of pure yeast system. A lot of it used in Europe. We've never made a full sales survey, but just from the literature alone, we would indicate that if they don't use it, they know better. Next. Yes. What's the meaning of kosher when applied to a wine? It means that a uh, rabbi has uh, verified in the process of making it that uh, whatever precepts, precepts are set out in the Talmud uh, will have been followed. I gather that it's fairly easy to conform in, to, the, to the winemaking. It's a little more difficult when you have kosher chicken and so forth, where the chicken must be cut in such a way that all the blood drains out of it uh, completely. Um, kosher wines, I think, are practically normal wines, and most American wines would conform. The only specific requirement being that the rabbi is present during the process of producing the wine and verifies that it is kosher wine. 
I, as a, as a Gentile, I couldn't do it, for example. So that's the, the main point. We've had kosher wines made in California during Prohibition at Sanger. The old Sanger winery did nothing but produce kosher wines. Um, some people, for the purposes of um, Passover and so forth, require uh, kosher wines, and we'll, we'll go to some trouble to get them. Most of the Reformed Jewish congregations in this country will use anything that's reasonably sweet for Passover. All right, next. Yes, sir. Sure. In Burgundy, where they have early ripening grape, as early ripening as uh, Pinot Noir, they still don't get ripe, and they don't develop the kind of flavor that they're interested in. They're interested in a, a flavor of a ripe grape if they can get it, but they're also interested in extracting as much of that Pinot flavor as they can. So for a hundred years now, more than a hundred years, they have learned that if they add to the Pinot Noir some sucrose, and if they get their alcohols above 12%, that it will taste more, I shall call it Pinot-y, for better, one of a better word. And that may just be a style. It might be that 11% Pinot Noir wines would be very pleasant. But they don't think so in Burgundy, and they go to a great deal of trouble to get that above. It's only for the red Burgundies they do that. Now, another form of shoptalization is practiced in Germany. Sometimes all the wines of a given year, 1950, for example, or 1930, other years, where none of the wines got ripe any place in Germany, then all the wines had sugar added. In other years, only a very small percentage of the wines need to have sugar added. There they were trying to get only something that was above 9% for the German Rieslings. And this is essentially the Eastern United States method of chapitalization. In the Eastern United States, they practice sugar almost universally. And what they're trying to get is something that will be around the 9 to 10% alcohol minimum. They may want to get it a little above that, but they, at least they have to have a 9 or 10% alcohol minimum. In this country, it's strictly governed by the law. There are tables for this that have been produced. You will find them in the ABC book in the chapter on Eastern Wine. Um, they cannot increase the volume more, must be less, than 35% increase in volume. And we have a special regulation for Eastern United States, both for sugar And for water, with the special provision that the water, that the acid, must not be reduced below 0.5% as tartar. This gives them 35% free wine, essentially, is what it, what it amounts to, 35% free wine. And if you were, before you, you faint in your seats and, um, and say that they're all um, cheating and so forth, if you had your choice of drinking 100% Concord and 65% Concord, you'd take the 65% Concord every day. It does dilute out the foxy flavor. Remarkably dilutes the foxy flavor. And in many cases, as you remember from bit three, I'll come to you in just a second. Uh, in many cases in bit three, you'll remember that the acid was too high in the Vitus Labrusca grapes. That was one reason it was not domesticated earlier, because they couldn't find grapes growing in the wild that had enough uh, sugar and didn't have too much acid. So uh, there, there is a very good reason for that, historically and practically both. Uh, I know the California industry feels that it's a 35% gift, and in a way it is a 35% gift. And I know that uh, many people in the East um, are concerned about it. Um, the winery called Bully Hill has just um, uh, last year, it's a small winery owned by Mr. Taylor, uh, has just decided that um, the, um, they will advertise their wines as uh, containing no water. And the magazine Wines and Vines uh, refused their advertisement this month, the current month. And the basis of the argument, you'll find it in the editorial in this month's Wines and Vines, 
the basis of the editorial was that the editor thought that if they advertised Bully Hill Wines, no water, that that implied that everybody else was using water and that was very bad, bad for the rest of the industry. And since I guess Wines and Vines has advertising from some of the rest of the industry, they decided not to let have that advertising. Yes. Do you think that sugar in our Pinot Noir is going to improve? I don't know. That's a very good question. We get so much uh, sugar already. We get 23 and 24 pretty easy. Uh, I think that we picked our Pinot Noirs a little bit riper than we do. I think the tendency is to worry about the Pinot Noirs in California because if we get a hot August, if we get a high sunshine, and we get a lot of 110 days, they raisin, and then you get not a ripe grape smell, but you get a raisin smell. So as between these two devils, the one where it's going to be raisins and the one where it doesn't have enough sugar, most people err on the side of not getting it really completely right. We could get them completely right. In 57, they did. I thought that was one of the good years for Napa Valley. Pinot Noirs. They ripened quite early. We did not have hot weather during the ripening, and uh, the Pinot Noirs all came off at 25 sugar and made some beautiful wines that year. We couldn't use sugar under the California Pure Food and Drug Regulations. It says that no wine labeled California wine will contain any sugar except that which is added to sparkling wines and making of the sparkling wines. So the question is a good question. It's an academic question at the moment in the sense that even if it were true, I don't know that they would uh, allow us to do it. Other questions? Yes, sir. Do you know anything about, or are there, is there good potential for the Suave or anything? Yes, I've been at Suave three times now. I know Suave pretty well. Uh, the Boa people have a big plant there, and they're the big importers of wines from Bartolino and Valpolicello. It's a hilly country, uh, not too far from Verona. Uh, it's a wall city, by the way. Suave is a wall city. It still has the city wall around it and has a castle up on the hill, which I just went to visit a couple of years ago. I had never gotten up there. So I drove up. There's nothing much to see in the castle. There's nothing much to see in the town. The <laughs> most of the wine is made by a cooperative in Suave. The vineyards look to be typical northern Italian vineyards, a lot of them on arbors, mixed varieties. Uh, none of the vineyard things that you see in Piedmont and Rose and so forth. The potential might be there. That is, if you, um, if you could get an, enough of an acreage, say 25 acres, uh, and you could get um, a single variety planted, and you could, uh, I think the cooperative would be capable of taking care of the grapes. It's pretty good technically, that cooperative is. Equipment is all right. That you might produce something better than the current Suave. I don't give Suave to the class anymore because it doesn't have any distinctive character of any kind, so it doesn't seem to be of any need to show it off. But it's a fairly good sized district. It has had been known for a long time, but if you asked me to describe what a good Suave was, I wouldn't know. But I, I know how I could improve it if I had the chance, and I think somebody else. The answer to your question is it might be, but depend on how many acres you could get and how you could control it, yes. Um, do the Azores produce a Madeira type wine, or no. is there some other wine that among other places I've been, I've been on the Azores too. <laughs> no, they don't produce, uh, they hardly produce any wine at all. And to, since you'll regret now having asked the question, they make uh, wine out of American Labrusca grapes, out of Isabella and Concord. Uh, they, during Phylloxera, the grapes were all wiped out, so they planted some Labruscas. They've now cultivated a taste for them, and they prefer them to viniferas. And they, if you give them a choice between a vinifera and an Americano, that's what they call it, They'll drink the Americano every day. It shows that you can have a perverted taste, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is there a possibility that it could get up to the wine district or the wine area? I only vi I visited two of the islands. Um, the one at Punta Delgada is on, I visited most. I spent three days there. Um, the soil doesn't look to be very deep. It's got a pretty high humidity as you can tell from the crops that are growing and so forth. And uh, on Santa Maria, where the airport is, the ground looks to be quite dry in that area and also not very deep. I've not spent enough time there to know. I think that they were well advised to stay with American grapes because of the humidity problems that they've gotten into. It never was a very big wine-producing area. There was a, 
few Azores wines in the 18th century and 19th century that were exported, but never very many. And I think it's because it's just wet out there. Um, some of the other islands I've passed by in, on another occasion, and they look quite tropical. They grow pineapples in greenhouses, however. They don't grow them out in the fields. Um, I don't know. I, if you're thinking about moving there, I would say no. It's, uh, it's a pretty lonely area in many respects. Uh, uh, you, can, you can see uh, Ponta Delgada, which is the biggest city, in two hours flat <laughs> from a slow start. <laughs> Americans have had a lot of connection with the islands, however. We discovered the hot, uh, the, the geysers there and wrote about them first geologically. The first American consul to the Azores uh, wrote about the hot springs. They've all died down now, the geysers have, but there is a little summer resort out there and um, uh, people from the mainland come who have connections in the Azores and stay at these little country hotels and so forth. It's a very reasonable place to go, but it's also a very remote part of the world. Yes. I've seen some uh, Washington State wines. I was wondering, what about Oregon? Are they... Yes, we have two students in Oregon now who are making wines, and they occasionally bring us samples down, and I noticed there was a third winery that just had some wines over at the Enology Building the other day. Um, I'll say what I said Tuesday night at, uh, in Sacramento and what I said in the Wall Street Journal a year ago. I wish them well. I hope they make some good and great wines. I think it would be good for California to have some competition to the north and west and east and south. But until I see a professional wine, I'm going to have to be a hard time convincing me what they're going to do. What I've seen so far have been amateur wines. And amateur wines may be interesting, but they don't have much trends on the American market. The wines from Washington State, for example, San Michele or something like that, were mostly exceedingly high in free SO2. And uh, I just think that that's uh, uh, poor technical control and there's no excuse for it in the modern world. And I think that uh, in addition to that, that the organ wines have been left on the skin, some of them too long, the white grapes. And I, the boys tell me exactly why it happened. I have to go out and earn a living. And we crushed on Thursday and I couldn't get home on Friday and they weren't pressed till Saturday and things like that. So I don't doubt that they'll make some good wines in both, in both states. And I hope they do. Yes. What do you think about the viticulture pro uh, possibilities up there? According, well, based on what Charles Corey wrote about it. Well, I think they can they can grow grapes up there, and uh, that isn't the point. Whether they can grow grapes or whether they can create a a wine type and a technology to go with it is two horses of two different colors. Um, I think that there have been a lot of amateurs make some very good wines occasionally but they not enough regularity to make, go into the business. And I think that's the problem that they're having up there right now. It would have been better off for them, I think, to have spent some time on the technical end of the business before they got into the public relations end of the business. Do you agree with Corey's feel about now this climatic zone? Well, he's one of our students. I, he proved to me beyond any doubt that uh, there are three climatic zones in the in the Napa Valley, the best, he didn't believe it, but when his data came out, that's what he showed. So whatever else he has in the theory, when you look at his data, it doesn't always prove his theory, but it does prove that there's a difference in climatic zones in the Napa Valley from one, two, and three. I think it's like writing a hobby, that he's got an idea there, and there's a certain amount of reason in it, and I don't see anything wrong with the idea, but can't get around heat summation is a major factor, I'm sure of that. He took Pinot Noirs. But his experiment was a very good one. Dr. Leiter was directing it, and uh, he went to Napa Valley and collected Pinot Noirs at Calistoga, at uh, Oakville, and uh, at Napa. And the sugar acids and colors and pHs all fell exactly in line. And that convinced me right there, because he didn't want it to show up that way. He wanted it to show up another way. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, does New Zealand produce any wines of any if you want to talk about New Zealand, the man that knows more about them than anybody else in the world uh, that I know of in America is right here on the campus talking to Professor Berg, who's going there this weekend. And Bern Ramey is the representative of the company that is establishing vineyards over there. And he's supposed to say hello to me as I go to laboratory at 2 o'clock. And if you'd like to be introduced, I'll introduce you to him. He'll tell you all about it. They've spent about $2 million there, I understand, already. So 
the answer to the question is they think so. Uh, my, I, I remain skeptical. <laughs> I remain skeptical for this reason. Any re region where the grapes are not being grown today, uh, there must be some reason for it. And because there was a tremendous demand for wines in the period from 1870 to 1890, any wine reaching Europe would make a lot of money considering what the cost of living were and labor costs were that day. So any area that didn't get planted, that was civilized by that time, and certainly New Zealand was civilized in 1870, there must have been some reasons why the experiments failed, because they sur surely tried it. And I think the reason in most cases they fail are just two. One, it gets too cold in many places in the world, and the other, they get spring frost. Or three, the humidity is too high and they get too many fungus diseases. And the technology now. But any kind of wine you sent to France in those days, raisin wines, they, they had to drink anything that had, that had alcohol in it. That's what they made. So um, uh, areas that have had grapes and have gone out, that worries me sometimes. And, and areas that have not been developed uh, viticulturally, when there was a demand for wine, when there was a big demand for wine, that also worries me somewhat. Why didn't Washington State go into wine grapes during the Prohibition period when there was a big demand for local wine grapes for home winemaking in Washington State? So um, uh, that's what worries me about it. Another, nevertheless, I encourage them all. We're encouraging them to the extent of Professor Bird going all the way to New Zealand tomorrow or next day. and. Uh, uh, I certainly have encouraged the Washington people in many ways and, and giving them help and sending them cuttings and so forth. I, I, it's their money. And let them lose it if they want. It's my, it's my recommendation. Okay, now I've taken up half the time, so I think the rest of it I'll stick to my outline. We don't take up these wines very much anymore in bit three, one, and two. Uh, the lecture that we will have on Port and Sherry is a very full lecture. There's a lot of very important points on the technology of Ports and Sherry's, and so that uh, I moved some of that material into this special lecture. We were supposed to be still continuing the Vermouth uh, lecture from last time, but after I finished, I could see that I hadn't moved anybody to making better Vermouths, and uh, nobody seemed to be uh, anxious to get in the Vermouth business, which is probably wise on that. And uh, so uh, I'll go on to these other types of wine, which do need uh, a little bit more emphasis. And there'll be a little repetition at the end. Marsalas were established during the Napoleonic Wars as a, another source for high alcohol wines of the sherry type, which they'd been getting from Spain. As you recall, the, the French method of, of bringing, coming to an accounting with uh, the British was to control the whole peninsula and, uh, in re and so they could get goods from there for living things, and then they blockaded, the, the English blockaded them from going out on the other side. Well, that cut the British off from Sherry for some 20 odd years. They had been there since about 1790, this was before the Napoleonic period, uh, in a small way, but they greatly expanded during the Napoleonic period and established a number of wineries uh, in the Marsala region. It was a pretty good region for doing it because there was a fairly good harbor there so the boats could come in directly. It's on the south side of Sicily. And they established a little English community there. You can still see the cemetery, the English church, and the English country club are still in existence. Uh, no, very few English people there, if any, anymore. The uh, raw materials they had to work with were as poor as you can imagine. They had uh, some local white wines. You can see they were trying to make a white wine of the sherry type or something that would serve for aperitif wine or sweet wine in the period of around 1800. They had a lot of dry white wine made from a variety called Enzolia, which is a white variety with low acid, and Cadarato, which is another white variety with moderate acid or higher acid. There are some other varieties they use, but the, these two varieties will be an example of what they had. The fermentations were hot. They were sometimes on the skin, usually on the skins. The new wines were rather oxidized, sometimes high in volatile acid, and rather flat and unpleasant. From this unprepossessing raw material, the British wine merchants, uh, with their know-how of alcohol and so forth, uh, began to make blends. 
And the, uh, the blends they made were, first of all, to increase the alcohol to fortify the wines so that they wouldn't spoil so soon. That was the first thing they started to do. The second thing, they realized they had to get some flavor in the wine. And they couldn't grow on these fortified wines. They couldn't grow up far yeast. And there's historically a reason why they couldn't. Nobody in Spain at that time knew very much about yeasts. They had occasional flora yeast, but the period when the flora yeast developed is within the last hundred years. It's a comparatively modern invention. Uh, it was a rare exception in the period before 1800. So the wine merchants wouldn't have known how to get flora yeast over here and get the alcohol just right and make that kind of wine. And they didn't have enough time to wait to age it like the Spanish people had done for their Olorosos and their sweet uh, sherry. So here they were then with a poor white wine, fortified with alcohol, and they looked around for a flavoring, flavoring agent. And what they got for a flavoring agent was coto. Coto is uh, grape juice boiled down in copper pots to about one-third the original volume. So they go from 20 up to uh, 60 uh, in sugar content. And it's over, over an open fire so that it burns. And you get a lot of, uh, of uh, darkening of color, formation of caramel and caramel-like compounds, and the development of a rather strong burnt flavor. In some cases, they took this koto and added alcohol other cases, they just kept the koto by itself. Most often, they added some alcohol to it. And they, they kept this koto around. So now they had a white wine that had been fortified, to which they added various amounts of koto, which gave it a flavor of caramel, and which they shipped directly. As time went on, uh, they also got, uh, in order to change the sugar content, uh, this loses a good deal of its sweetening ability as it boils down here. As caramel forms, there, there's a reduction in the sweetness of the residue that's left here. And so they then would get uh, what they call mute. This would be SO2 grape juice. Or they might get what they call mistella. And this would be fortified grape juice. And in, uh, comparatively later than that, they got concentrate, great concentrate. Not very good concentrate, but concentrate. So they had a, a wide variety of raw materials then. They had white wines of varying quality. They had good fortifying alcohol. They had koto, various ages, various percents of alcohol, various degrees of the burnt character. They had mute, they had mistella, and they had concentrate. And from these, they made a wide variety of wines from very light colored wines uh, which more or less resembled a dry sherry up to very very dark uh, colored wines that um, uh, practically ran out like black strap molasses they were so caramelized and and so heavy in color the uh, english controlled the industry till 1914 but during the first world war the liquidation began and continued after the war as the British attempted to liquidate their war cost and was finally completed before the Second World War so that all the industry now is Italian. The types, however, are all English. The label on the wine that you're going to see today is more than half English, not just for the American market. That's the only kind of label that this wine has ever had, has been an English label. It was developed by English wine merchants, so forth. They used English words, I feel sees. S-O-M, that's a very common one. It means superior old Marsala. Or sometimes you'll see S-P-O-M. Superior pale old Marsala. Or we're going to have one today, S-E-M. Superior extra Marsala. Uh, a lot of those kinds of things. And they had some meaning. Now, uh, the modern industry uses a lot of fractional blending. They have Solaris set up. Uh, not in small containers, but large size Solaris, because they have no flora growing, so it's to their advantage to have anywhere from five to 20,000 gallon tanks in which they're keeping their mother stocks and into which they are blending younger materials and then after a period of time drawing off and filling them up again. Some of these uh, Solaris look to be uh, two or three steps in depth. 
and they're apparently operated in a very complicated way. A little bit of this Solera and a little bit of that Solera is used to make the very shipping blends. A normal Marsala company will have anywhere from five to ten different blends on the market at one time. A few of these are for the Italian market. They have one very sweet, very powerful flavored one which they call the Garibaldi Marsala in honor of Garibaldi, the liberator of modern uh, Italy. Uh, they have developed just in recent years uh, more quality control and uh, we're going to have a pleasant surprise this afternoon uh, and, and I seem to be been prophetic when I wrote this in the lecture several days ago that um, modern quality control has improved the industry because we hadn't noticed that before but the literature showed that it was developing and so forth. They're also getting some better varieties of grapes in this region and I would think that perhaps they had a permanent chance to get back on the world market. They lost two-thirds of their trade in the Second World War and uh, they were very discouraged uh, after the war and some of the companies even thought about quitting and other of the companies went into all kinds of, of oddities. They went into Marsala and eggs and almond Marsala, things like that, trying to spread their market in order to get a certain amount of volume turnover. But now they seem to be recovering, their sales are increasing in the common market and uh, the wine type seems to have had a rebirth which I wouldn't have predicted a few years ago. Madeira was making uh, wines which were sort of natural sherries up till about 1853. And then they got hit by a series of American fungus diseases. Uh, the first one was um, uh, they got uh, plasmopora or mildew and it's a very humid climate and so until they got a hold of, um, of uh, copper sprays uh, they had practically all their grapes mildewing before they got ripe. Then they got black rot or anthra and anthracnose both and these uh, further cut down the crop until methods of, uh, of control were developed. And then on top of that they got phylloxera also from America. So they just love us viticulturally in the Madeira Islands. Uh, this meant that they had to replant and most of the vineyards were replanted with non-vinifera grapes. Very hard for us to accept that. Even hard for them to accept it. Most of the time they will deny it. But if you go out in the vineyards and look, you'll see that perhaps as much as 50% is Jacquettes, which is an old Nebraska variety. It's red, very resistant to mildew, and somewhat resistant to phylloxera, although it's not the best resistance to phylloxera. And uh, so in the 1870s and 1880s, the wines were getting, never getting ripe. The grapes were never getting ripe. Uh, this Jacques is not a, noted for its high sugar content, even in the best of conditions. Uh, so they, they were getting wines of 8 and 9 percent of alcohol. Before they could get these wines uh, into the barrel and uh, aged and fortified at the time of shipment, they were vinegar. So they had a long period of time in the 1870s and 1880s where it was doubtful what they could do on the world market. Some old stocks were available and some people blended the new wines with the old ones. But they had learned about pasteurization sometime before and the heating process and so they began to use it as a method of making Madeiras. The new wines were immediately fortified if they had the alcohol or if they didn't have the alcohol they put them in the hot houses, the estufas, the warm houses, stove houses I guess would be the correct way of saying that. Uh, at about, uh, uh, well at, at first they were using um, steam but later they got other methods of heating and the current method is that they keep them at 140 degrees for three to four months and they're kind of persnickety the government is they don't let the temperature go above 140 degrees they have uh, minimum maximum thermometers sealed into the tank so if you go above that temperature you get a fine and so forth uh, this produced a wine that was uh, had a certain amount of um, baked character the wines had darkened but they were stable if they hadn't been fortified they were stable because they'd been pasteurized by the heat treatment if they had been fortified before the heat treatment, 
why that um, gave them an extra flavor alone and the alcohol helped to keep them. Since World War II, and uh, uh, since the last five years now, not since World War II, the last five years, all the wines have been fortified immediately after they're made. They decided that would make better wine. And then they're heated. So even though they lose a little alcohol in the heating process, uh, they, they are willing to do that now for the making better wines. They still have a lot of problems in, um, in um, making the wines good, however. The, the grape juices all have to come down from way up in the mountains. In some cases, it takes a day or two to get it down. Uh, one of them up in an old volcano, uh, floor of the valley of an old volcano, and that's a dirty little road to get in and out of anyway. And even worse during the vintage season when these little trucks are moving back and forth. It's not true they bring the grapes in in goat skins anymore, although they have a few men around with goat skins to pose for the tourist pictures. But they used to bring them down that way. Uh, even as late as World War I and afterward, they uh, had goat skins, the apertures closed off, and they would put the grape juice in them. Uh, uh, they, uh, they were pretty heavy, uh, but they dragged them down. It was all downhill from up in these mountain vineyards. Well, the first problem was in, is in fractional blending. They all have fractional blending systems here of varying ages and of varying degrees of quality. Some of them uh, uh, are on the low sugar side, and some of them are on the middle sugar side, and some of them are on the high sugar side. In order to get enough wine from, for sweetening, they take some of the grape juice and fortify it, <coughs> and they call that vino surio. So you have baked wine and vino surio, uh, and these are blended to the proper sugar content, and they're then aged by a fractional blending system, which I'll explain the next in the lecture on fortified wines in more detail. And they can make quite a wide variety of uh, wines of this kind. Most companies make at least three types. A reasonably dry one, which they call surchial, a quite sweet one, which they call bowl, or in Portuguese, wall, and a very sweet one, which they call melmsy. But since they have this large amount of jaquez, the variety names no longer have any meaning. There is very little grapes for producing surchal, the traditional grapes that were used for that. There is a fair amount of wall. There's not much malmsey left in the island. Land is expensive and highly divided, and I don't see really a great deal of hope for improving Madeiras, except the tourist trade is drinking up quite a bit of them now. They've got a huge tourist trade going on there. The occupational diseases have always been high volatile acidity. The one today is not terribly high, but that's the lowest one we've had in many years. These failure to fortify early enough, the poor quality grapes that are coming in, they pick in August and early September. So you can see, the grapes are only about 18, sometimes 19 when they're picked, with quite a bit of mildew on them. It's, not the, it's a good place for tourists and for making sugar and growing pineapple and bananas, but that's about all. Now you will see on the market in Sacramento and San Francisco and New York, and London, Paris, well, almost any place you want around the world, uh, 18, 20, and 22 dollar a bottle, 17.90, but Madeiras, 1900 Madeiras, 1870 Soleras, and so forth. Um, we've um, not been able to believe these. The law of compound interest being what it is, uh, that isn't enough money. You started with a bottle worth a dollar, and you keep it 200 years. Some of you just calculate up at say six percent what the cost of the wine is going to be. Furthermore, if you go there as a tourist, uh, you can see that the whitewashed markers on them and so forth have all just been put on them fresh. Those were supposed to be put on them when they were laid down before they were labeled to keep them separate from each other. And uh, if you ask the merchants point blank. Uh, how much 1790 does it contain? 
they shrug their shoulder and say, well, I bought it from somebody who lives up on the mountainside. Well, considering the small number of grapes and the large number of years that have gone by, the number of these wines which can be completely authentic must be very small. Now, if they kept them in wood, which they sometimes say they have done, then they get into some very difficult problems of technology because uh, let's assume that they kept it there that long and they lost 6% a year by volume. Well, let's assume that it's only 3%. I think Professor Ress and I calculated for both. Uh, the, the, the amount of the original wine that's left in the barrel is very small and the total acid content is going to be about 3 or 4%. And that's not what it has when it gets on the market because tartaric acid is just going to keep con concentrating. So for many reasons, I just don't think you can keep wines in the barrel that long. In places where you have any losses of wine, and uh, if they're in bottle, then the unless the people have lost all sense of um, uh, banking and so forth, and most of the people I've seen in the Madeira Islands were smart enough, um, the, the prices are too low, not too high, and uh, because uh, they have that big an investment in the wines, just in, by from the original cost. Anyway, it's a nice place to go. Very nice vacation spot. Malaga is a high sugar, moderate alcohol wine made in the south of Spain, and it represents the only attempt I know of outside of Russia to use the deli principle, in which sugar is used for its antiseptic value, as well as alcohol, to prevent fermentation. And the wines have about 20% sugar times 15% alcohol, in many cases. Some are even sweeter than that. They're made from Muscat of Alexandria grapes primarily, although there are some Pedro Jimenez grapes in that district. And um, the um, grapes get quite raisined. They put them on trays in the vineyard anywhere from two days to two weeks. And at Malaga, that's a long time. Uh, they, um, they taste like raisins. Their chief characteristic is raisin. They're very low in acid, they're, and that's their chief disadvantage. They have no acid taste at all. They're very, very low in, in acid. They've never been able to develop a very big market, but I think if they, somebody was interested in it and could follow the process through, he might persuade them to produce something a little, with modern technology, they could produce something not so sweet and also low in alcohol with a more ameliorated raisin flavor. There's nothing wrong with raisins. We eat raisins for iron. We make raisin pies. We make so-called pecan pies with raisins in them, things like that. Uh, and um, so I, I don't think people object to the raisin flavor except when it gets too concentrated and too sweet all at the same time. It's like, like drinking raisin syrup, and that tastes too flat. And I would try and give it a little bit more excitement with a little bit more acid. I think you could make something, at least you could sell to the tourists down in that part of Spain, which at the present time you can. Now I want to just say a little bit more about two countries and then we'll say a word or two about flavored wines. Uh, I didn't tell you about South Africa has now the new development of the what I call the carbon dioxide phobia. I'm not sure this is entirely a phobia, but they are doing the crushing of grapes, the pressing of grapes, and the entire handling of the must uh, through the fermentation all under carbon dioxide. Under the principle that they don't want any oxidation in their white wines. This is for white wines. So the crusher has carbon dioxide running over it constantly when the grapes are being crushed. And there is an inhibition of any oxidizing enzymes, uh, enzymes of any kind from crushing straight through the pressing and clear into the to the fermenting tank, which is filled with CO2 before the, the uh, grape juice is introduced. Well, I've seen this, and most of my colleagues have seen this now. We have not come to any great conclusion. It's a fairly expensive operation, even where carbon dioxide is, is cheap. The samples shown us did not, in any case, seem to justify all of the effort, although 
they claimed to say that they said that they didn't taste as oxidized to them, but I couldn't find that much difference in them. That's uh, the CO2 problem. I already said that there is a lack of high quality varieties in South Africa. Um, this is owing to the long period of time when the industry was oriented to, to become a blending industry for the British market. What the British market wanted was 13% dark red wines that could be blended with British wines and other wines of that type on the local English market. And uh, at least that's what the English said they wanted. And the people that were making the wine in South Africa agreed with them. Now I think they would agree that they probably had made a mistake, that they should have planted some better varieties that wouldn't produce 13% alcohol wine uh, and varieties that had more character and that they should have tried to upgrade their image. And they are doing that now, and I don't think I told you this last time, or if I did, I didn't emphasize it enough. They are going in for Appalachians of origin in a big way uh, in order to get into the European common market and in order to retain their position in the, in the British market. They have another problem that uh, should not be a difficult problem. They have a large number of cooperatives, uh, and some of them are fairly well equipped, although some of them are a little bit lacking in controls of temperature and things like that, and a fair number of um, people who know how to make wine, so that that technical problem should not be too difficult to solve if they just don't get onto this too much of this CO2 business and run their costs up. Uh, it's easier to find, for my, it was easier for me to find a white wine that was pleasant in South Africa than it was to find a red wine, because the red wines, they don't really care for very much themselves, and uh, they don't age them very much. They brought out a few old ones, which I think were too old when they were bottled. The best wines that I had from there are Muscatels and Ports, and some Sherry's. Some of the Sherry's were quite good. Until quite recently, you could buy uh, South African port out at uh, L&M, but lately they haven't been distributed. I don't know the reason for that. And then, of course, the, the market in South Africa is very limited. You have the, the large Reformed Church, Dutch Reformed Church uh, people who either don't drink very much or drink very modestly, more interested in other things than drinking. And um, they do drink. They want a Scotch whiskey or something, brandy or something like that and a very relatively small clientele of English people who are interested in high quality wine. And the French influence is completely gone. They have French names, but they have long since become Africans and have forgotten any French influence. So, so that to get a high, a high demand for better quality wines is sort of lacking on the market. They're trying to superimpose on this industry a quality image through the KWV, which I did speak about last time, and this may work. Now, I don't need to talk about the varieties and so forth. Australia already did that. The warm fermentations I did not emphasize, though. In the Mildura district and several other districts of Australia where refrigeration has not come in in a big way, particularly in the cooperatives, they get quite hot fermentations like we do down the valley when we don't have refrigeration. And this leads to stuck fermentations and various problems. There's some lack of acid in some districts, partly due to the varieties, but partly due to the hot climatic condition. On sherry production, they did a lot of basic work on film yeast cherries, and uh, they have not gone into either the Spanish system or the American system. Uh, I don't know quite why, because uh, Professor Fornichon uh, did some experiments which indicated that submerged culture would work, but he never followed up on it at all. In fact, it was four or five years after his initial shake culture experiments that we got the idea of submerged culture yeast here and worked it out commercially. Uh, they're using an intermediate sized tank, usually concrete tanks, rather squat concrete tanks, with usually a, some sort of wooden cover on it and the film growing on the uh, surface. Now in recent years they've gone into some flat tanks as well, and very sharp stave tanks, only three or four feet high, but holding 1,000, 2,000 gallons. Uh, Martini, as most of you know, has done some work with these large tank ones, and the Novitiate of Las Gatas has also. Uh, but they haven't had small tanks. They've had 20-foot tall tanks and one foot of wine in it, 
and a surface. You have to have a certain surface to volume relationship to make a film yeast process worthwhile. Well, they didn't make that mistake in Australia. They built small stave areas so you didn't have all that air space above it, not such a big air space. And uh, also they could put two or three of these on top of each other in the same room. Instead of the room being all occupied by big 20-foot tanks, they would have three layers of shark tanks in the room, uh, each of them three or four feet uh, tall. Um, at any rate, they're making a lot of floor sherry and um, at what apparently is not, for them at least at this stage, too much expense. Uh, if we, I've already told you, or if I haven't, I will tell you now, that in California, attempts to make film yeast cherry in barrels have generally failed because the labor cost ate up all the profits in it, unless you went to something uh, three or four dollars a bottle and more. And most of the market surveys show that a California film yeast cherry starting out on the market at three or four dollars would not have very much appeal. Now, we may be wrong on that, but that's what the market survey showed. It wasn't our surveys, but other people's surveys. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, the wines produced by this process in, in, South, in Australia are selling on the market there at only about $1.50 or something like that, a bottle. Well, now that doesn't leave me much uh, time for the flavored wines, but I would say that it's true that there's a lack of reliable information. Almost all the production of flavored wines is still privileged information, or what we call proprietary information. Uh, the citrus flavored wines, in general, use essential oils, although there have been some that have tried to use fresh oranges and fresh lemons with varying degrees of unsuccess. Notice I said unsuccess. So that now I would guess that the essential oils are using most of it. The original ones were about 10% sugar and 18% alcohol, but in quite recent times you can see a lot of flavored wines on the market stabilized at perhaps 8% sugar and only 12 or 13% alcohol by germ-proof filtration and so forth. There have been other flavor mixtures devised the mixtures using passion fruit or essential oils from tropical fruit and so forth. Uh, these have um, been of some success and some not successful. Bali High, I believe, is still fairly well established on the market. That represents that fruit flavor, orange flavor type of mixture. And then more recently, within the last three or four years, we've had a lot of fruit wines on the market, some with other flavors and some with not. Most of them uh, germ-proof filtered and uh, lightly carbonated so that they're slightly gassy. These have been produced at fairly low alcohols, which is technically quite a big achievement, and they do seem to be having some impact on the market. About 16 to 18 million gallons impact on the market. So much impact on the market that there's a worldwide shortage of apple juice right now, created by California. So it's not a little thing, it's a very big thing. Have a nice weekend. Fuel.